So I've been involved in this space for about seven years now. It was about 2010 when I first uh, you know, got involved with uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and blockchain. Um, I, I founded a company called Banky Moon, which is the company that you see here, which is a consulting and advisory company. Um, we've been uh, uh, working with all the banks uh, in Southern Africa. Um, I've also um, uh, been involved with a lot of major organizations like the World Bank the I and the IMF. Um, I've uh, spoken at many conferences like the United Nations uh, uh, recently with uh, actually Tawanda as well. Um, so I spend a lot of time uh, going around the world speaking to big organizations, government organizations as an advisor, um, but also as a company trying to see how this technology can be used from an African development perspective. Uh, you know, clearly, uh, you know, Africa has, uh, it's, an, it's a developing continent, and uh, it's very important that we look at emerging technologies to try and see how they can benefit Africans. So my focus is entirely Afri Afro Afrocentric. Um, uh, I would love to be able to find solutions for the continent, and so my whole focus is around uh, uh, leapfrogging technologies as Africans tend to do. You know, if we think about mobile adoption and all that sort of thing, this uh, very early on in the in the in the my history with this technology, I could see it as uh, a, an opportunity uh, where uh, uh, us as Africans can uh, perhaps uh, use these sorts of currencies uh, to to close the digital banking divide. You know, throughout Africa, there's a lot of Africans who don't have access to traditional banking services, um, which means they're cut out of a large part of the global economy. And so I've been working very closely again with our regulators, specifically in South Africa and our Reserve Bank. Uh, we've, we've done multiple uh, workshops. Uh, you know, uh, they are very, we're working very closely with them to help them understand the technology, but also to find those opportunities. But also very specifically from a governance perspective, because if we are dealing with a technology that is by definition something that is uncontrollable, of course, from a regulatory perspective, that's a very a dangerous thing. So uh, what we've been exploring is, is all the aspects of this and making sure that if there are any ways that this technology can have governance and regulation, then we, we will uh, obviously we must try and, and explore that. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to share with you what we have uh, uh, established and how why our Reserve Bank is now very optimistic about this technology. They're not worried anymore because they have now seen that it's not something that just can happen, you know, and nobody has any visibility on it. You're going to see that, and I'm going to take you through the whole thing. I'm going to give you a, an explanation of what it is, and then I'm going to show you why it's, it's actually impossible, really, for uh, people to adopt this technology and to remain hidden. Uh, uh, you're going to see that exactly the same sorts of regulations that are applied to mobile com money companies like Impesa and EcoCash are exactly the same as what we can apply to this. So um, much of your thinking around Impesa and EcoCash will be brought into this technology. And, and yes, of course, there are differences, but at the end of the day, you're not going to have to now invent a whole lot of new policies and new you know, uh, things to be able to uh, uh, allow a technology like this to exist. You're going to see that it is a good technology. Um, it's going to enable a lot of opportunities, and you will still be able to have a finger on what's going on and uh, allow these uh, uh, these new opportunities to be uh, exposed and revealed, and it, you'll see how it's going to really uplift the continent. It really is uh, uh, something that is uh, 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 good for for uh, humanity as a whole, but certainly as for Africans specifically. So um, that's kind of my background. Um, again, uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time explaining these things to regulators. I work closely with them, and I think after today, you're going to have a much better understanding about what it is, and where you will be able to now have oversight and uh, what you'll be able to, to bring to bear to this new thing. Okay, so uh, let me then uh, uh, start. Um, please stop me if you have a question, if something's not clear. Um, I'm going to try and keep it uh, uh, so you don't get tired of my voice and you don't get, uh, you know, uh, you want me to move on quickly. So uh, let me begin. Now, uh, what I want to do first of all is take you back to the internet. You know, that once upon a time when the internet came along, it was also quite an, an, a mysterious technology. Now people can communicate, you know, without using a post office, without using telephones. Um, it was a very, very strange technology, and there were many meetings in those days like this one where we were talking about how the internet can facilitate terrorism and all that sort of thing. So, you know, uh, what we are experiencing today with this new technology, this cryptocurrency technology, is very similar to what happened with the internet, where the internet was this new network that allowed people to move information around. 
so, uh, so it's not unusual for there to be new technologies that when we look at them we think, this is scary, this is going to enable all sorts of bad actors to do things. The internet was exactly the same sort of thing. The biggest issues was that, uh, remember when uh, music downloads started becoming an issue, you know, there was a company called Napster, and Napster allowed people to download music and download movies. And uh, uh, people were very worried, especially the music industry and the movie industry, because now people could steal music. And uh, uh, the, the issue there was, how do we now have a regulated industry where people can download music and movies uh, as they like? Uh, but what we found with a company like Napster was that um, uh, it was quite possible to now go uh, as a regulator to be able to go to the company, Napster as a company, and actually shut them down. That was a, a very important thing to realize that we could do that. We could go find a business and we could say, look, you're not uh, uh, doing anything correctly. You know, you're uh, uh, evading the law and uh, we're going to shut you down. But then there was a new technology called BitTorrent, which, which came out. And instead of having a, a single company that now allowed people to download music, what we had was this now this technology where people can connect to each other all around the world and they can now move uh, and steal movies and copy movies and copy music. So this was a big issue with the internet. People are now allowed, uh, uh, had the opportunity to be able to download movies and music. And uh, uh, it was a big issue because they thought, now the music industry is definitely going to be destroyed. The movie industry is going to be destroyed. Because how do you shut down each one of these individual computers? You can't go to everybody's computer on the web and say, are you downloading movies? Are you stealing movies? Um, so uh, what we had now was a big issue. This was now, in the, I can't remember, in the early 2000s when BitTorrent came along, and of course regulators became very concerned about that. But what we then found was that uh, uh, you know, uh, when, when, we, when we created a regulated industry uh, where people could download movies and music, you know, like iTunes and Netflix like today, um, we realized that it's now possible to be able to allow digital music and allow digital downloads of movies but within a regulated environment where we can now know the companies and we can regulate them. We can control the, and they must know their customers. And uh, we can see the payments that are being made. So you can see when a new technology comes along, it feels scary. Uh, we think that it's going to be disruptive and it's going to destroy the status quo. But what we then realize is that we can take that technology and we can regulate it and we can create new business models. And that's what the movie and the music industry found. So what we are in now today is a similar sort of situation where we, we first see this technology and we think this is scary, this is going to make us as regulators you know, uh, uh, worried, but yet if we allow it to, per, uh, to uh, develop, we're going to see that it's going to be like music and movies, where we can have a legitimate businesses that, uh, that have AML uh, and KYC uh, regulations and uh, obligations and we can then track and know what's going on. So what I want to do now is I want to tell you and explain to you what blockchain and Bitcoin is. And I promise you after this in a few minutes you will understand it perfectly. And you'll be experts and then it won't be this mysterious thing that feels scary. Okay, so that's what I want to uh, do as well as uh, uh, this. So this is just a, a picture of, of uh, a bank. And we know that a bank has a database, so we have a picture there of a database. And in that database we have an account register or a ledger. And that ledger has accounts and it has balances and those accounts are linked to people or businesses. So you know that that's how a bank works. They've got this, this uh, business. Uh, and then what happens is when um, uh, somebody wants to go make a payment, a uh, digital payment, either using a credit card or debit card or even a mobile money payment, what happens is that uh, a customer will come along and they will go and, and uh, send an instruction to the bank to be able to now move money for them. Okay, so if you understand this, you're very, very close to understanding how Bitcoin works. That we have this database with a ledger, and every time somebody wants to transact, we send a message to uh, the, the bank uh, to be able to do our transaction. But the way Bitcoin works, it's slightly different. We don't have a bank that is now controlling that, that account or that ledger. Okay, what happens is, is that we have all these volunteers around the world that are all hosting copies, exact copies, of that ledger. And they're all spread around the world. They're all distributed around the world in this decentralized way. So it's exactly like a bank, but we don't have a bank, a physical organization that is now managing and maintaining that ledger. It's distributed around the world. And that's why we call this a decentralized system. There isn't one organization that you can go and shut down. 
So it's starting to feel very similar to that BitTorrent technology that allowed people to move files, you know, download movies and download music. So this is where you guys come in and say, this is a bit uh, scary because now how do we stop somebody from uh, moving money, uh, you know, if we don't want them to? Um, so uh, this is what I'm going to now explain to you, that this is not the whole story. This is that story of BitTorrent, but you're going to see now by creating a regulated environment and allowing businesses like Golix to exist, you are then going to be able to become like what iTunes and, and Netflix did, create a, a regulated environment where people can now transact with oversight, because that is the most important role that you have to play here. But let me quickly take it one step back. Why is it called a blockchain? I just wonder if you've heard of that word and you wondered why it's called a blockchain. Well, it's just about how the information is structured. So here we have a group of transactions. So basically, sender account, receiver account, and how much. And the way that this database is built up is that every few minutes, a group of those transactions are put together into a block. We call that a block. And then a few minutes goes by, and then we group another blo block of transactions together. And then we have a blockchain, okay, a chain of blocks of transactions. Okay, so that is it. We have a database that's structured in blocks, like this way, they're chained together and that is distributed around the world. If you understand that, you now understand exactly what this Bitcoin blockchain cryptocurrency thing is all about. Okay, so let's now talk more about the, the how does uh, a, a central bank, how do uh, the financial intelligence, uh, how do you now have oversight on what's going on in this space? How can you create a regulated environment where you don't have risk of capital flight or you don't have risk of money laundering and all that sort of thing? Well. If people want to now transact with Bitcoin today, there are a number of organizations that you need. You're going to need to have uh, financial companies perhaps like Golix. You're going to need to have merchants that accept the currency. Uh, you're going to have the operators that are processing those transactions. They're called miners right at the bottom there. That's a miner. If you've ever heard of Bitcoin mining, mining just means processing transactions those computers out there in the world that are processing these transactions. So you can see that there are a number of entities that exist out there to be able to facilitate transactions. If I want to go and buy something with Bitcoin, I'm going to need to use a payment gateway, something maybe like EcoCash. If I want to uh, uh, have my transaction processed, I'm going to need a miner. If I want to buy Bitcoins, I need a, a Bitcoin exchange. And those are organizations and entities that will be the ones that you now go and apply your policies to. In exactly the same way that you apply your policies to EcoCash and to M-Pesa and to any other no uh, number of money transfer operators or money operators, you will do the same thing. You will go to them and say, we want to audit you. We want to make sure that you are reporting suspicious transactions. We want to know who your customers are. We want to know what you're doing. Now, if you don't create an environment like this, if you do not allow a company like Golix to exist, what are people going to do? They're just going to operate entirely in that uh, anonymous place, like with BitTorrent today, where people are pirating movies. But if you create and allow uh, businesses like Golex and businesses like mine even, because uh, I'm a payment processor for merchants. So one day, uh, uh, you know, pick and pay and okay, and these merchants here today, uh, they already accept EcoCash, they will accept Bitcoin, but they will use my merchant gateway. And that means I am a company that you can come to and say, Show me everything. I want to see everything that you're doing. Um, if you, so this is why it's so important for uh, you as a regulator to say, we are going to create that environment. We are going to have uh, some licenses perhaps or some rules. And if you uh, 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 apply those rules, then we will allow you to exist. And by doing that, suddenly the vast majority of people who want to engage in these, these currencies, if they want to use these currencies, if they want to go and buy something with uh, Bitcoin, if they want to go and buy Bitcoin, they're not going to go to an anonymous person. They're not going to do this because most people nowadays don't pirate music. You know, the, the vast majority of us, we will use something like iTunes or Netflix or Spotify or something like that. Most people do. But of course, you will always have some people who are pirates, you know, the, the teenagers and whoever are just fooling around, but uh, uh, the vast majority of people will use these sorts of services. So this is why it's so important to now think about using, creating a, an environment for companies to exist. Because if you don't, all people are going to do is go below the radar. 
They're going to transact in a black market. And uh, 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 that's going to be completely unknown to you. You'll never have access to what's going on. You'll never have visibility and never have control. So by moving forward in the space, and, and I'm happy to say that our own Reserve Bank is already doing this. They're saying, we understand this. Uh, we know that if we, if we uh, create a positive environment, a regulated environment, and we allow Bitcoin businesses to flourish, it means that most people are now going to be using those services, and finally we have a point that we can now uh, have oversight. We call them the on and off ramp. You know, when you want to get into Bitcoin, you go through a regulated entity. When you want to get out of Bitcoin, you want to cash out or whatever you want to do, you want to buy, you go through a regulated entity. So that is why it's so important, and that's why our Reserve Bank is now happy for us to proceed. We are, we are uh, sharing with them everything that we're doing. What we do is uh, uh, we talk about what we want to achieve, and then they, they, they will uh, give us advice and say, okay, this is maybe what you should do. Um, we are applying the very same KYC and AML uh, uh, requirements to our own business. So we only allow people to uh, buy a certain amount anonymously per day. If they want to buy more, they have to give us their identity and their address and all that sort of thing. So can you see how we're just using existing uh, laws and policies to apply to the same business? And eventually, we're going to be using this in the same way we use M-Pesa. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's almost 99% like M-Pesa, except uh, M-Pesa obviously is, a, is, a, is something that maybe operates within a jurisdiction. Bitcoin has a, a global jurisdiction, um, but you, you can still have visibility and oversight and control over what happens within the country. If people want to move money out, you're going to know about it. You will have controls over it. If they want to now cash out lots of Bitcoin into local currency, you will know about it. Can you see how by creating a, a, a regulated environment and allowing businesses to exist, you will accelerate your oversight and your control over what's going on? If you do not, if you, if you uh, uh, don't move quickly over with Golix, people are going to start you know, doing uh, anything they can to get, get uh, Bitcoins and then you will have no control and no oversight. Uh, let me just quickly go over another little thing. I want to show you that you know, even though Bitcoin seems to be something that's anonymous, you're going to see that one of the amazing things about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies is that the ledger, that ledger of transactions, is public. Now, a bank has a private ledger. You know, if you transact with a bank, and there's nothing, I, I can't see what you're doing, you know. But uh, the way Bitcoin works is that if you know the identity of those uh, accounts in Bitcoin, then you will be able to track as a, without asking for permission, you'll be able to go to that public ledger and you'll be able to have visibility on transactions. So again, if I am a, a regulated entity, you're going to know all my accounts. And you won't have to say, Lorian, please come and give me your reports. Show me your accounts. Show me your transactions. I want to audit you now. You don't have to ask me for that. You just go to the Bitcoin blockchain. You already know my accounts. And you can go and immediately have up to the minute access of what's going on with my, uh, my accounting. Can you see how incredible it is? So Bitcoin is actually more visible and uh, you have more access to it than even in Pesa or EcoCash because you don't know what's going on in the background with EcoCash. You, you, you can ask for reporting, but you know, uh, how do you know how accurate that is? Well, with this, there's nothing you can hide. Uh, this is the most transparent and visible. So this is just something I wanted to show you that uh, I know it's a little bit of a technical drawing, but what happens is every time money moves through the blocks, let's say in the blockchain, you now have this history you can see where every single bit of transaction happened. You can see that money moved from this account to this account to this account to this account. And it can never be deleted. It can never be erased. So again, not only do you have visibility on balances on accounts, you have visibility on history of, of accounts. Absolutely uh, uh, public and transparent. And what I wanted to show you is that if a hacker comes out and says, or, or uh, somebody who's a criminal, and they have an account, and they say, we want to now launder money through this account, you can see it immediately. And you can immediately see where that money is moving. And especially because uh, if a money launderer wants to move money through a system like this, what are they going to do? They're going to have to go to Golix to be able to cash out of that Bitcoin. And uh, again, if Bitcoin is a regulated entity and you've given them uh, 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 the ability to be able to create a business that, that uh, can now support an industry like this, you now are able to go to Golex and say, we've now seen some uh, money moving through the system. We want you to tell us who that person is. So money launderers are not using Bitcoin because it's too visible. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, the transactions are visible on the blockchain. But second of all, as soon as that money launderer wants to cash out, of that Bitcoin and into local currency, you immediately can see it. Uh, you can now uh, have, uh, know who that person is 
and uh, uh, be able to track them and uh, uh, clamp down on them. So, you know, when it first started out, you thought to yourself, this is an anonymous system, people can just move money anywhere in the world, how are we ever going to control this, how are we ever going to allow this, we mustn't. But now you can see that this is actually something that is more visible, more transparent, you have more control over, and by cre again creating a positive uh, regulated environment, the vast majority of people are going to be transacting in that environment and you will be able to know exactly what is going on. If you know the identity of an account, although in Bitcoin we call it an address, like an email address, you have a Bitcoin address. So let's just think of that as an account, it's synonymous with an account. If you know the identity of the person who owns that account, it, you can see everything what that, that account is doing. But very often what happens is you can create an account and not make your identity public. So Bitcoin is not anonymous, it's what's called pseudonymous. Pseudonymous means we can see it, but we don't necessarily know who that account belongs to. But if you create a regulated environment where Golix has to report on those accounts, those addresses, then you do know. So yes, it, uh, uh, when you say it's contrary to everything you, you believe, exactly. I mean, this is exactly what people are missing. This is what regulators don't understand. And this is what I uh, am constantly sharing with them, is that in a regulated environment, by allowing Bitcoin businesses to exist, suddenly you can now have visibility on those transactions and know who is transacting with whom. If you do not create an environment like that, then you will forever never know who's doing what. And uh, you will never have visibility on those on transactions. You'll see them. You will see big money moving around, but you don't know where it's going. You don't know if it's country China to Zimbabwe. You don't know what's going on. The only way you will know that is by creating an environment where Bitcoin businesses can grow and flourish. And by pushing that agenda, by saying we are encouraging businesses to move into the space, Bitcoin businesses to create value around it, it means that it will accelerate your agenda. It will mean that you now are able to uh, uh, quickly create an environment where you can have uh, uh, immediate uh, visibility on transactions. But by delaying, What's going to happen is people are going to move money, they're going to move money, they're going to find their own ways, they're going to create their own services, they're going to do their own anonymous transactions, and you're going to cultivate an anonymous world where you're out of the loop. So this is not something that you must be thinking about in the next few years. Like our own Reserve Bank, South African Reserve Bank, they need it, they see the importance of it now. Because by, by stimulating an environment, by, uh, by pushing uh, 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 the, 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 your policies forward in this space, in this regard, even if it is just creating a sandbox, uh, uh, something like that, and saying, Golix, we're not giving you official permission, but we are going to allow you to proceed, we are going to watch you, we are going to make statements like Golix is acceptable, and that means customers will immediately come to Golix, and now immediately they, uh, we can start tracking what customers are doing with Bitcoin. But by delaying, you're going to now uh, cultivate an environment where people get used to transacting outside of a system. And then you will uh, be too late to the party. You know, very often things, you know, take time, but some things shouldn't take time. And our Reserve Bank has already realized that, that uh, this is the best way forward. This is just a picture. There's a business that's called um, uh, Elliptic. And the, there was a famous uh, uh, website back in the day, early days called Silk Road, where people were buying drugs. And so what uh, uh, these guys did is that they were able to track money moving from that website, that dark website, into the exchanges. So what we have here is we've got uh, local bitcoins, a known exchange, known exchange. So immediately you can see money moving from that website, the, the, the dark website, to an exchange. And if that exchange is now regulated and knows their customers, you now know who's the guy who's now cashing out on that drug money. Okay, so this is why uh, if you didn't have that exchange, if you didn't allow uh, Bitcoin businesses to exist, it's going to be, you'll never know what's going on. And people will just be able to facilitate transactions and you're out of the loop. So this is now why I must uh, uh, express upon you and, and give you the same feeling that our Reserve Bank is, is that this is something that you should be making positive statements about already. Because then it will stimulate an environment where Bitcoin businesses start feeling, ah, oh, okay, it's okay, this is a good environment, I'm going to start adding value. And by those businesses then creating a customer base, you already now have the ability to move in and have your vis the visibility that you require. Okay, so the source of funds, and you can clarify this, remember that they come from banks, and the banks already have all those uh, 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 requirements already about source of funds. So again, by uh, an exchange operating with a bank, you suddenly now have 
everything that you need to be able to understand, because those banks already have that source of funds uh, wrapped up. They already have that uh, function, you see. What we have in our own country is we've got uh, uh, Luna.com, which is like Golix. Uh, they are uh, an exchange that's regulated and they ha uh, are, are growing very well and our Reserve Bank is quite happy with uh, what they're doing because they ha have all the right, uh, 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 they're doing all the right stuff in terms of KYC and AML. And then uh, Sendby, which is my merchant uh, payment system, which we hope to bring. And then of course, uh, Golix. I just want to show you another interesting thing. This is the largest Bitcoin exchange in, in America, in the US. In fact, they're around the world. And uh, this is just something that happened a few days ago. Uh, uh, the the IRS uh, went and said, "All right, you know, we don't want now. We want now uh, records. We want to know who's been transacting." And uh, it just shows you that uh, even though these guys are making gains with their bitcoins, and you know, the price is going up, and they're selling out, the IRS, the you know, the Internal Revenue Service, they are now able to get tax, you know, from uh, uh, people. So this is also a taxable thing. You know, if you are, are, are making money either through uh, trading or through uh, as a merchant. Uh, you, you know, we can see how regulators around the world are starting to look at it as uh, something that can be taxed. Obviously, uh, deciding what sort of thing it is. Is it a commodity? Does it have capital gains? Is it a currency? Uh, even in our own country, uh, uh, my friend and colleague is the head of the finan South African Financial Blockchain As uh, Association or consortium, uh, which has got all the major banks and the Reserve Bank and SARS and everybody involved. Uh, they're talking about how to tax uh, Bitcoin transactions. They're thinking about maybe putting a sales tax in there. Um, so you can see now how uh, this is becoming a, 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 a mature environment uh, around the world in southern Africa and I'm sure that soon enough you will be uh, doing something similar. But it just shows you if you have a regulated business, a regulated exchange, uh, you allow these businesses to flourish, you will now have tax opportunities too. What Bitcoin acts very much like is a commodity, like a, like gold, if you like, a, a, a digital commodity, because uh, there are, is a supply and demand dynamic. Now in, in Zim, uh, there's very little supply very little Bitcoin here, so people are willing to pay more for it because the demand, you know, uh, is is great. So people are, are willing to pay higher prices. But in other countries, like in Southern Africa, South Africa, our, our supply is a bit better, so the price is a bit lower. And then in other countries and so on. So it very much acts like a commodity that is traded, and and depending on the supply and the demand dynamics, the price uh, varies, of course. So what I want to do in the next uh, slide was just show you that there are uh, also important opportunities here. Uh, you know, often uh, uh, when we when we think about um, uh, remittance, you know, uh, you know, people of course want to move money around the world, and Africa has extremely expensive uh, costs for moving money. You know, Africa has the most expensive corridors in the world, um, so people are looking at uh, uh, something like Bitcoin to be able to uh, cheaply and quickly move money cross border. Now, of course, that is probably the most scary thing from a regulatory point of view. But uh, again, what we are doing uh, in, our, in, in South Africa is that we are actually creating uh, 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 useful services to be able to facilitate those transactions. Now, um, uh, by us being a regulated entity, it means that we again can now have restrictions and also uh, 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 we can provide insight to regulators on how much money is moving uh, because people are going to be probably using our services more than any other. Now, people have the opportunity to just send Bitcoin anonymously, if you like, uh, from one place to another, but it, you need a certain level of, of a skill, and also Bitcoin itself is useless. You know, if, I, if somebody in Zim, an expat, wants to send money back home here, uh, by sending Bitcoin, it's, it's very difficult to, to, to use. I mean, uh, uh, you need somebody who's got technical competency. You know, Bitcoin right now is very unusable. Um, so what we are doing is we're creating a, a kind of remittance product that works with EcoCash. But again, can you see how by, uh, by us creating a product and being a regulated entity, it means that now our regulators can see how much money uh, is moving and we can put limits uh, because we're providing value on top of the transaction. We are actually making uh, money uh, usable in, in, uh, from South Africa to Zimbabwe by you making it uh, partnering with uh, EcoCash. So um, this is now an opportunity again that, uh, because I know you're not just worried about uh, uh, oversight in terms of control, you also would like to uh, make sure that your own population has access to services that benefit. I mean, you, you, that, that's part of your mandate is to make Zim a better place. And so what we can do now is uh, by using this technology, you can add positive benefits to the people here by allowing them to not get milked by these money transfer operators for huge amounts, you know, a lot of a lot of money, I know, I mean, people in Zim send money here all the time and they pay huge amounts to do it. Often they go through those informal channels, you know, taxis and envelopes and suitcases. 
Um, so what we can do now is we're trying to make it a legitimate business that uh, regulators have oversight and to create value for that customer so they can move money quickly, safely, reliably into EcoCash that becomes usable on the other side. Uh, so this is an opportunity. So you must think more than just regulation oversight. You must also think about positive benefits for the people. Okay, and this is why uh, Bitcoin is, a, is, is useful as well, valuable, because it does have benefits. It, it is a, a positive thing. These are World Bank figures I got for the major banks that move money. So uh, uh, I think the top one, the 28% is Nedbank, is moving money here to Zim, no, uh, to uh, Botswana, Mozambique, Malawi. Um, but uh, uh, some of the, 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 the companies are, are charging between, what, is it 10, 15, 10%? Um, I, I also, just another benefit, because my time is now uh, running out and I want to make sure the questions. Um, this is Uber. Now, Uber, in, in South Africa, we've got Uber. And what happens with Uber is that uh, people basically uh, can hail a cab and then you, you can now uh, use Uber to make payments. But uh, uh, what's nice about these sorts of uh, transactions with Bitcoin is that you can actually uh, remove Uber out of the situation. So Uber doesn't take a fee from that transaction and you can pay your driver directly. Uh, this is, these are the sorts of business opportunities that are coming up with this ability to now directly pay people. Um, uh, so you're going to see again how a lot of the middlemen involved in transactions that which take value out of that transaction will be able to be uh, added you know, directly to the, 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 the merchant or the service provider. So Bitcoin is, is going to really be a positive benefit to merchants and sales, you know, people who sell things, where instead of having a middleman taking a fee, they can actually earn fees directly. Also, I, I want to end on this now because this is a human story that uh, I was involved with in South Africa. Um, we created a technology where people could uh, buy uh, uh, electricity directly on a smart meter using Bitcoin. And uh, that meant that now you could buy electricity anywhere in the world. Uh, uh, so what we did was we created a, a, a pilot um, because we were thinking in terms of, uh, of foreign aid. You know, right now with foreign aid, uh, uh, if you want to fund a cause you believe in, you have to go through an intermediary like a charity or something. And they take admin costs and they take fees and they and they also they put the money where they like and sometimes there's corruption so by basically a, a technology like this you can actually now allow people to from anywhere in the world to directly fund charitable causes so what we did was we installed a, a meter at a little school called MOE primary in, uh, in in South Africa um, because we thought if we create a, a, a ability for foreign donors to directly fund the, the school's energy costs that will give them a lot of, uh, the donors, a lot of confidence. You know, they know that all their money is going directly to that cause. They don't have to go through an intermediary. They don't have to trust uh, that the money is being spent in the right sort of way. So what we did was we did this uh, demo at MOENI, uh, and a colleague of mine at MIT, um, uh, uh, this was a TED talk. I was invited to speak on this project that I created here. Um, we sent a Bitcoin directly to this meter at the school, and you know it was a very, a very exciting uh, uh, time. So it just shows you that Bitcoin is going to be, again, something that is really going to bring a lot of positive benefits in terms of all sorts of different things, and one of them is charitable uh, funding, where foreign donors can now have confidence that the money that they are spending on that cause they believe in is going directly to that cause without money leaking out of the bucket. And if you would like to hear more about that story, that uh, Osizo uh, project that we created uh, in Soweto, um, you can just go to uh, YouTube and type Gamaroff TEDx, and you'll see the talk that I gave about this uh, thing. In fact, I talk about, I mean, I was, I was born in, in Harare. So, I, I, you know, I, I, the story starts with me just saying, you know, I was born here. But, and I also talk about hyperinflation as well. Uh, you know, that's a, a, obviously what people are concerned about around the world. It's not just uh, locally. I mean, we look at Venezuela, we look at other countries are inflating their currencies and people are, you know, concerned about it. So um, uh, go look, have a look at that and you can see more about how uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies can really help uh, donors have confidence in the funding that they are, are, are sending to different uh, or, uh, causes. Okay, so I'll end in that. Uh, uh, it's 12 o'clock. I think that was my time is up. I hope maybe we still have time for more questions. I'm happy to answer as many as you like.